Welcome back, everyone. Now, we are going to get a little serious for the next few minutes. For all the fun times we spend enjoying our area's beaches, ponds, and pools, it's important to keep safety in mind. Florida loses more children under the age of five to drowning than any other state, enough to fill three to four preschool classrooms annually, according to the Florida Department of Health. And when it comes to water safety, our next guest says an ounce of prevention is the best cure. Joining us with some really important information, we welcome the director of the Florida Department of Health in Duval County, Dr. Kelly Wells. Welcome back. Thank you. Very excited Thank to have you. you. And a very important topic. Yes. Because Florida is surrounded by water, but why do you think drownings are so much higher here than opposed to Hawaii or California? Well, I, th I think it's a combination of things. I think when you have a, a population that's that's fairly diverse, then the standards around teaching uh, swimming safety, for instance, can be different depending on the type of environment that you that you grow up in. I also think that there are uh, some risk factors that play into that that maybe aren't related to you know swimming pools, right? So mm -hmm. kids can drown in a tiny amount of water. So that number includes things like bathtubs and buckets sure. of water and retention ponds and ditches and those kinds of things as well. And you hear about it every summer, this tragic needless drowning. It's so terrifying for parents. And I've even interviewed parents who their kid almost drowned right. and they suffered maybe loss of oxygen, brain damage. It's so important that they know how to swim from an early age. And if you don't have access to swimming lessons, that, that can be an issue for a lot of parents. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. I think that that's very, very important. And what we find is, in many cases, parents underestimate the risk, right? And so they think that the precautions they're taking in terms of having adults present when swimming is happening, that kind of thing, they think that's enough. Now, I'm going to share something that um, Chris Porter, just a small part of what, what he um, shared really from his heart and um, his thoughts on swimming, not just in the African-American community, but all communities, that if parents don't know how to swim, mm -hmm. then the chances are their children won't know how to swim. Let's, let's listen to what he, had, what he had to say. The USA Swimming Foundation study shows that if a parent does not know how to swim, then there is only a 13% chance that a child in that household will learn how to swim. My wife, Jovi, can swim. So too can her parents. I cannot. My mother can't swim either. My aunt is learning how to swim. But her dad, well, I'm planning to sign up for swimming lessons soon. Hmm. So it was really so powerful. I mean, I still get the chills when I see that, just because it's someone that you know. And um, so what, what, a, what is your recommendation for parents? Should they learn how to swim? Or if they don't know how to swim, should they still obviously give their kids? Lessons. Absolutely. So I think that, that there are a few things that come up as very important related to what Chris was saying. One is um, adults, in order to be safe around water, need themselves to have at least basic swim safety understanding, right? So even if you don't, you know, go full-fledged and, and do swim lessons, like I, what I say is, you know, I'm not a swimmer, but I won't die if you throw me mm -hmm. in, but I'm not going to look cute, you know, trying to get to the side. You know, so I'm one of the, <laughs> right? right, right. Um, and so, you know, that's important in terms of being able to navigate a dangerous situation or be of assistance if somebody is observed being in, tr in trouble. But I think the message that it sends to young people for a parent to step out and learn to swim is actually pretty valuable as well, right? So, you know, we talk a lot about how we model health behaviors for our children. So your kid is watching you go to the doctor, take care of yourself, eat healthy. If your kid is watching you learn to swim even as an adult, it sends that message mm -hmm. that this is something that's very, very important to do and I should do it as well. Also something very important you talk about is active supervision for parents. What does that mean? Right, so I, I said earlier that often parents think because there are adults present when kids are swimming that that's safe. And what we find happens is because there's not a, a designated water watcher, number one, and number two, that we haven't defined what water watching is, that there's still the risk of something terrible happening. So in, in our community recently, we've had a couple of um, real tragedies that have occurred, and there weren't sort of children-only events, right? And so active supervision means you remain you know, within touch distance of the group of children who are swimming. There's one designated person that's doing it, and there's an understanding among the adults that are present that we're not going to be engaging the water watcher in conversation really while they are assigned to, wow. to do that. Right. Think yeah, about the, about the distractions now, that occur. Now, where do you recommend parents go to get their kids swimming? Mine went to the Y, and it worked great, but well, there are lots of options. There are so many options, and I, and I think that the options only become limited if finances are a concern, mm -hmm. right? So there are some programs through the city of Jacksonville 
uh, through Parks and Rec to uh, provide free swimming lessons to those who meet the financial criteria. But there are a lot of other options. The Y is one. We've utilized that. Um, uh, if you're military dependent, the Navy bases typically will have some sort oh, yeah, of great, programs. Yeah, um, and they're all similar in structure in terms of assessing where your kid is in terms of skill and, and, and uh, building a set of uh, lessons around your kids' uh, capabilities. Before, before we move on to another topic, um, what, what about, I know in Florida, I think it's the law that you have to have fences around pools. Is that, how effective really is that? Does that help people, you know, false sense of security? Oh, I've got a, a, a gate there, my kid will never get through there. Yeah, so I, I think it does. I think that, that we're, what we're lacking is uh, adequate training of parents on what to check and how often to check it, right? And so depending on when your house was built, how old your pool is, how old your fence is, that sort of thing, we find there are a lot of opportunities to kind of get that wrong, right? We have folks who are using pool covers, mm -hmm. which can be a hazard if they're not, you know, specifically designed for your pool and they're, you know, they're, they're firm as opposed to the burlap sort of covers that exist. Um, uh, simple alarms, like so things that alarm when a door opens so that you know that a child has gone through some door right? We have little kids who crawl out pet doors to get yeah. to pool areas and so the things that we wouldn't think of. Mm -hmm. So it's always nice to have someone come in and sort of do an assessment for you to see the things that maybe aren't immediately evident to you. Those are really great reminders. Yeah. But we want to move on to another health risk that's uh, having an impact right now in Duval County. A rise in new HIV cases. According to a new study released by AIDS SVU, the Jacksonville area ranks the ninth highest for the new, diag new HIV diagnosis in the U.S. So, Dr. Wells, according to this new study, we are the ninth. Mm -hmm. Why is it so high in Duval? So, it, it is complicated in terms of the things that put you at risk for contracting HIV, right? So, the, the things that put you at risk for uh, contracting that have to do with sexual behaviors, access to information about what to do to keep yourself safe, um, uh, whether or not you have appropriate access to preventive measures, so condoms and that sort of thing, um, and, and the treatments that exist now to prevent uh, transmission if you have access to that. So I think we can't have that conversation without talking about the fact that, like we've talked about health disparities in other areas, this is another place where disparities exist related to your access to the appropriate things to do to keep yourself safe. Um, we certainly see uh, a larger number of infections um, both in heterosexual females um, and in males who are having sex with males, typically in minority populations, but not exclusively. And so that's where we do a lot of our targeting in terms of information about how to stay safe. So for and, a long time, uh, you know, it seemed like you didn't hear that much about it. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of drugs, antiviral drugs, um, that you just kind of take some pills and you're fine. I mean, is that the case or is that still kind of the rumor to keep it, um, you know? So it's partially true and I, and I think that's one of the things you know, as we try to uh, capture folks in to be screened, which we're finding is still an issue. We have a lot of adults who have engaged in some sort of sexual risk at some point in their lives who've never been tested for HIV, who don't think they're at risk because they, are, they have these predefined risk factors in their head, right? And the guide, guidance is that every adult should be tested at least once in their lifetime, wow, right? Sure. And then if you're engaging in high-risk behaviors, you should be tested more often. So there are medications that exist to suppress the viral load so that it is what we call undetectable, right? So Magic Johnson, that's mm -hmm. kind of, mm -hmm. and it, that decreases the, the chances of transmission to an uninfected partner. But you've gotta be on medication. Right? And so if you slip out of care and stop taking medication, your insurance lapses and you no longer have access to those medications, then you can get rebound of the viral load and be, you know, infectious again. And you, you talked about screening though. Mm -hmm. What I mean, what if somebody out there right now is thinking maybe I was exposed to this? What should they do? Sure. So there there are a lot of ways to, to do this. And I and I one of the things that as a family physician I wish we could do a better job of is making the testing and screening for HIV routine, right? We tend to carve it out and attach it to sexual behaviors in a manner that, that again lets folks, including physicians, opt out of who should be screened, right? So that universal screening that I described based on age and risk goes out the window because I am applying you know, my own lens. You're probably not at risk, so we won't check you. So I really want to see more of that testing occur in the setting of your primary physician's office, right? We, we're not there yet. So 
the way we at the department function in this manner is to open the door and allow folks to walk into any one of our centers. We do a lot of community outreach. We've got a couple of uh, mobile units that move around the city and do free uh, testing for folks um, because we want to make it easy. You know, we test young people, um, older folks, we test women during pregnancy, you know, that sort of thing. And so there are a lot of avenues if you can just get to the Department of Health. And, and, and it's easy and it's low to no cost at the Department of Health. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So t HIV testing is free. Yeah. Yes, no cost. Great information, very important information. Thank you as always, Dr. Kelly Wells, for coming and bringing this to us. And for more information, visit duval.floridahealth.gov. And coming up next, a new adventure for a familiar face around town. Find out where the Chris Thomas Band is headed and how you can see them before they go. We'll be right back.